This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Okay, good evening everybody and uh, a very warm welcome to the evening seminar here at the Refugee Law Initiative. For those of you who don't know me, I'm David Council, the Director. It gives me very great pleasure for today's event to introduce Professor Richard Kittredt. Um, he's going to be speaking on a topic which I know has garnered a great deal of interest through the remainder of the seminar series that we've had so far. And this is on the limits of refugee law, human trafficking and challenges to the international protection regime. Now, before handing over to Professor Pietrovitz, I'd just like to say a few words of introduction, although I'm sure by reputation it's known to many of you. Um, professor Pietrovitz is first and foremost a professor of law at Aberystwyth University, where he's been since 1999, previously having taught in the universities of Glasgow, Durham, and Tasmania. In terms of his work on the issue of trafficking, he's been a consultant to several international organisations, the state as well, and a member of the European Commission group of experts on trafficking in human beings since 2008, reappointed in 2011. He's also recently been elected to Greta, which I believe he'll explain a bit further, as of the 1st of January 2013, and on the refugee law side of things, participated in UNHCR's Global Consultations Programme as a nominee of the Australian Government back in 2001. He's also the book editor for the International Journal of Refugee Law. Without further ado, I say it gives me very great pleasure to introduce our speaker and to thank him for his time. Thank you, David. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm not going to use the microphone. I'm just going to stand here. And if you can't hear me, just let me know. Throw money or something. I will respond very favorably. Um, and thank you, David, for SAS for inviting me to give this talk this evening. Um, the, 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 so, I, as David said, I've come from Aberystwyth, so for those of you, I appreciate you coming here in a cold evening. It's, I've come a lot further, and it's a lot colder there than it is here. But I can get to Berlin faster than I can get to London from Aberystwyth. It's, nevertheless, I'm very pleased to be here. And as David said, the, the subject of my talk, which I hope will be no more than about 40 minutes, is the protection of victims of trafficking and the limits of refugee law. And what I want to do is to talk about how um, refugee law and, if you like, anti-trafficking law and the protection of victims of trafficking have kind of coexisted and have sometimes merged and come together and then sometimes seemingly gone their separate ways since roughly about the year 2000. So I want to just explore those two uh, paths, if you like, which sometimes converge and sometimes go uh, in different ways. And it's a kind of a journey from Palermo to Strasbourg via Warsaw, Geneva and Brussels. So we'll, we'll go around Europe quite a bit. Now, before I go any further, um, I know there are some people here who know an awful lot about trafficking, but I don't know if everybody has. So if you bear with me, I just want to give you a working definition of human trafficking, because it's crucial to what I want to talk about. And trafficking as defined in the Palermo Protocol, this is an issue adopted in 2000, which is, has more or less a standard, widely accepted definition of trafficking, with about 170 ratifications by now. Trafficking involves three elements if you traffic somebody. It's a process. And this is crucial to understanding what's going on. It's a process. And it involves a number of actors. From, if you imagine a scenario, somebody ad answers an advert offering work uh, in, say, Amsterdam or London, work in as a waiter or a waitress. So they're recruited. They may be lied to, they may be tricked. They then have to travel from wherever they come from, country X, to get to London. They may do so by crossing borders illegally, or they may go by air with a proper passport. But somebody takes them. Somebody provides accommodation on the way. Maybe more than one person does that. Finally, they arrive at their destination, and probably their passport or their ID card will be taken from them and they will end up in the situation where they're going to be exploited, whether it's for 
sex trade or some other kind of labour exploitation. And a lot of people think trafficking is just for the sex trade. It is simply not true. And it is becoming more and more recognised that trafficking can be for other reasons. So you have a process with several actors involved. And that is crucial because the Palermo Protocol definition talks about three elements of trafficking. The act, which is like the recruitment, the harbouring, of the receiving of people, the methods, which can be by fraud or deceit or force, and the purpose or the motivation, which is for exploitation. And exploitation doesn't have to be financial. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. And it's crucial that one appreciates that any of those acts, or by any of those actors, can be trafficking. Because if it, if it were not the case, then let us just say that I recruit people, I run a dodgy travel agency or an employment agency, and I'm accused of trafficking, I say, well, I'm not a trafficker, because I didn't do all the other parts. And it's crucial to appreciate the definition of trafficking that anybody who does any one of those things, recruiting, harbouring, transporting, transferring, or the final exploitation is a trafficker. So that's our working definition. Okay? Now, we have several actors involved. Now, the Council of... Another concept I want to address here is the Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Trafficking, which was adopted in Warsaw in 2005, talks about trafficking in human beings as a human rights violation. Now, I don't think that trafficking in human human beings is a human rights violation. You will also find many other instruments that talk about trafficking as a human rights violation. The the EU Directive of 2011 on trafficking, which is due to come into effect in all member states by about the 13th of April, talks about trafficking as a human rights violation. But it isn't. There is a human rights dimension that I will come to. But trafficking is primarily, in my opinion, a criminal act. It's a private criminal enterprise. So, if, for example, I come up to one of you, say I come up to you, and I punch you in the nose, I'm not going to punch you in the nose. Would you say that I'm violating the human rights? No. I agree. Why not? It's not it's not fair. It's not a human rights violation, is it? It's, well, a, it's a violent act. Yeah. Yeah. But trafficking is a violent act. It involves restraining somebody, it can involve false imprisonment, it can involve serious physical and sexual abuse, serious psychological abuse, all of those things. So, it's a violent thing. It's as much more extreme than simply you punching me in the nose or vice versa. But why is it not a human rights violation, despite all those instruments? And I should be careful criticizing the Council of Europe Convention since I'm supposed to be involved in monitoring it. But. <laughs> Why do I say it's not a human rights violation? Because my definition of human rights is about obligations which are owned by states towards those within their jurisdiction. And normally, trafficking is not a state, an act of the state. There may be collusion by the state, there may be corruption of border officials, for instance, in which case, obviously, one can talk about state law. But I think it's a bit of a misnomer to talk about trafficking as a human rights violation in that sense. But there is a human rights dimension that I will come to. And I don't think this is simply a matter of playing around with sports. I think it is not only conceptually important, I think there's, there are practical ramifications because speaking as a lawyer, when we think about how law is best going to address human trafficking, whether it's from the perspective of the rights of the victims and the protection of the victims, which is for me the most important part, or whether it's from the perspective of trying to catch and uh, tackle the traffickers. One needs to know what animal one is dealing with and in order to, if you like, frame the law and use the law in the most effective way. That's why I think it's important to understand what we're dealing with. But sometimes when I say, oh, it's not a human rights violation, people get terribly excited and they're not disappointed to see that none of you got excited, but anyway. So, but there is, there is a human rights dimension that I will come to. So, we have a situation where people are placed in extremely, some of extremely violent uh, dilemmas and they are more or less powerless. What does international law have to say about it? And in particular, what does international refugee law have to say about it? Because we're talking here about the situation. I'm not talking about trafficking within one country, such as those girls who have been sexually abused in the North of England, which is in the papers again even today. We're talking here about transnational trafficking because, of course, with refugee law, we're talking about getting sanctuary in another country because of the risk 
to you in your own country. So this is what we're talking about. Of course, we could be talking about it. Let us say somebody's traffic was in country A, was in their own country, and they escaped to country B. Then there could be a refugee law issue. But I don't need to go into that here. So we're talking really about transnational trafficking. What is happening when this takes place? Let me just take you through briefly through the main instruments which are relevant here, because as I said, we're talking partly about refugee law, but also partly about this different strand of law, which is emerged dealing with trafficking in particular, and I'm going to finish by saying that we see the emergence of refugee law, which I think, if we go back to about the year 2000 or 2001, was treated as almost an irrelevance for trafficking, to a situation now where, uh, the, for example, the United Kingdom Upper Tribunal is recognising rather easily that certain people who are at risk of being trafficked may be entitled to refugee status, which I think is a very positive development, but I do not think that in actual fact it is crucial for the protection of victims of trafficking. And I want you to try just to take you through this to illustrate it and hopefully take you with me. So we have this process. We started in Palermo with adopting this protocol in 2000, which I mentioned already. And I think it's a great place to adopt a protocol on organised crime. <laughs> it's like going to Glasgow for a protocol on religious tolerance or to go for, for a protocol on safe environmental, safe nuclear energy. Where do they go? Palermo. Wonderful. Somebody at the UN has a sense of humor. So, Palermo, they adopted this in the year 2000. This is not a human rights instrument. It is, and it has been criticized in a number of quarters for not offering enough in terms of protecting the rights of victims, but I think that was a bit unfair because it was never meant to be a human rights instrument. It is an instrument aimed at promoting action among states to against trafficking, transnational trafficking as a crime, as an offence. There is some reference in part two of the protocol to the rights of victims. It's rather limited, it's more, it's more aspirational than mandatory, telling the states should do their best. But of course, it is in any case without prejudice to states' obligations under wider human rights law and, and if necessary, the Refugees Convention. But we have this first instrument that was adopted. It's not the first ever instrument on human trafficking but, or slavery, but it was, a, I think, year, year 2000 is almost a kind of a year zero as far as trafficking is concerned. I don't want to take the Khmer Rouge analogy too far. We then go on to the global consultations in 2001. Now, this is important because the global consultations on the Refugees Convention dealt with different issues, but at the San Remo meeting in September 2001, one of the issues dealt with was membership of a particular social group, which I think was utterly crucial to understanding the possible refugee status of people at risk of being trafficked. Now, at this meeting, the issue of whether trafficking, it was never discussed, but the issue of whether trafficking, uh, human trafficking should be discussed in this context was raised, and it was immediately uh, dismissed by the floor, saying it's not on the agenda. I know it was raised because I raised it. Now, What's interesting was that outside the meeting, while still in San Remo, some people from UNHCR came to me and said, actually, there is interest in UNHCR in looking at how the Refugees Convention can be used to help victims of trafficking, although it was not on the agenda in that meeting in San Remo. And sure as hell, we move on from San Remo to the next year when the UNHCR commissions the drafting of guidelines on how the Refugees Convention could be applied to assist at least some victims of trafficking. And I will come back to that. Because being a UN process, while the, the initial commission took place in 2002, the guidelines only actually appeared in 2006. And I know that the guidelines were finalised in early 2005 because somebody showed me them and said, I can't have them. She sort of let me see them and then, you know, hide them behind her back and say, I mustn't try to read them because, you know, World War III will break out or something like that. Because the, the UN the process of getting it through was a rather lengthy and perhaps tedious one. So we have these guidelines in process already in 2002, but they don't come out, actually, they don't actually appear for a few more years. Then we move to Brussels in 2004, of course, we have the adoption of the Qualification Directive. And this is very important for the international protection of victims of trafficking, particularly because of what it says about subsidiary or complementary protection, and in particular the fact that Article 15b, not Article 15c, which we spoke about at great length last week, but Article 15b, 
recognizes as one of the threats uh, torture or inhuman degrading treatment or punishment, which is clearly the type of treatment to which uh, trafficked people can be subjected. I don't think that's an issue. And Article 6, Paragraph C of that qualification directive, which specifically states that non-state actors can be agents of persecution. And as I already pointed out to you, most traffickers are not acting for the state, they're not agents of the state. It's a private criminal enterprise. So we have subsidiary protection coming in, even although the refugees thing is still problematic. I'm going to come back to the refugees in a, in a moment, okay? So please bear with me. So we've moved from Palermo via San Remo to Brussels. We then move on to Warsaw, 2005, when the Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Trafficking of Human Beings was adopted, setting up this body called Greta to monitor the application of the convention and this is a body to which I was selected uh, a couple of months ago and our job is to investigate how member states of the Council of Europe Convention and Warsaw Convention are actually implementing their obligations under that convention and this is very much focused on putting the, the rights of the victims at the centre of the process. Of course it's interesting to I don't think one can talk about trafficking only in terms of protection of rights or trying to punish the perpetrators. But it is clear that the Warsaw Convention places protection of the victims and the rights of the victims very much at the core of what is going on. So that is our focus. So by 2005, we've moved to Warsaw. Then in 2006, hallelujah, we go to Geneva because finally the UNHCR's guidelines on the application of the Refugees Convention to the, the victims of, or potential victims of trafficking are published, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. So, we have here formal guidance from the UNHCR to states on how in certain situations, people who are at risk of being trafficked may actually be entitled to refugee status, and I will move back to that just in a moment. Okay? But having gone to Geneva, we then move on to Brussels, because in 2011 the EU adopted its latest directive which replaced a decision, framework decision adopted in 2002 on preventing and combating trafficking in human beings. And that directive again places the rights of the victims much more at the centre of the, at least in principle, at the centre of consideration rather than worrying so much about punishing the perpetrators. So there's a real movement from 2000 when we have a more or less uh, focus on the criminal aspect of trafficking to increase at least in principle recognition of the need to protect the victims and to respect, to respect first of all to recognise and then respect the rights. And I say to recognise because one of the problems with trafficking is sometimes recognising that you have somebody who has been trafficked in your hands. In other words, training uh, people, police officers or people working in the border agency to recognise when somebody who comes to attention may in fact have been trafficked. Because if that person is not recognised as having been trafficked, then there's a real risk that they're going to be victimised yet again. First of all by the traffickers and then by the authorities of the state whose attention they've come. They may be deported uh, to even greater risk because it is not recognised that they are a victim of trafficking and it is therefore very important in the practical implementation of those things that states are aware that they have to take specific measures to do this. Now, I don't know about you how often you travel but I, I, I fly in and out of the country quite often and I rarely at airports see warnings about alerting people to the fact that people might have been trafficked. Although it can happen, people come in on airplanes huh? or they come in through other border posts. But the, in principle, it is happening. In reality, I don't think it's happening as much as it should be. So, we have the EU directive, though, which again stresses the human rights aspect. And then we finally end up in Strasbourg, and the very important decision, which I will come back to later, of Grantsev against Cyprus and Russia, which is the first ever decision of the European Court of Human Rights to deal with trafficking in the sense that we understand it. There are there are one or two other decisions under Article 4, the prohibition on slavery, servitude, and forced labour, which are relevant, in particular one action uh, brought against France. But Rancière has really, I think, changed the game in a big way. And I will come back to that. 
Now, help me again about convergence, if you like, between the Refugees Convention and anti-trafficking measures. You will find in the Refugees Convention, which I'm sure most of you know, a provision that somebody who seeks asylum should not be punished simply on the ground that she or he has irregularly crossed the border, because it is recognised that sometimes people have no option but to do that. But they should, within a reasonable time, present themselves to the national authorities. Similarly, in a way, under the Council of Europe Convention and the 2011 EU Directive, there is a non-punishment provision. People should not be punished or prosecuted for acts they have committed, which on the face of it are criminal acts, if they did so because they did so in the process of being trafficked or because they have been trafficked. So somebody might, for example, cross the border illegally. They may have no option because they've been trafficked across the border. They may be working without a work permit. They have no option. They've been trafficked. They've been forced. That's the idea behind this. Now, the principle, I think, is pretty straightforward. I think all of you will recognize this. You understand it. You don't blame somebody for something which is really not their fault. But the application of it is much more problematic. And in particular because, for example, in some legal systems, the moment you have on the face of it an apparent offence, there's an obligation to initiate a prosecution. And so the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe uh, last year commissioned a major study on this, along with some guidelines on how this should be applied, both in civil law jurisdictions and in common law jurisdictions. And these guidelines and the background reports are hopefully going to be published in April. Uh, so and I know about, about that because I wrote, I wrote quite a lot of it. So that hopefully is coming out uh, very soon. So let me, having taken you through this rather um, perhaps peripheral way, the different stages in this process for the last 10 years or so, let me come to the core issue of trafficking and refugee status. Now, my second point is that most people who are at risk of being trafficked will not, probably not qualify for refugee status in terms of the 1951 Refugees Convention. Remember, when we're talking about refugee status, we're talking about a risk in the future. Of course, what has happened to you in the past is very often crucial to assessing that risk and to establishing that there is a real risk. But we're talking about what, why you do not want to go back to your home state because of a risk to you in your home state. In the context of trafficking, we're talking about somebody who's been trafficked from state X, perhaps through states Y and Z, into state A. So source transit and destination countries. They may have been abused in one way or another in each of those countries. And they come to the attention of the state and say, well, I don't want to go home because I'm scared of being re-trafficked, for instance. This is one of the problems that we have. But if we think, I mentioned membership of a particular social group earlier, which was discussed in the San Remo meeting in 2001. This is crucial to understanding how somebody can qualify as a refugee who fears being trafficked. Because if, we, if you think about the definition of a refugee under the convention, you must have a well-founded fear of persecution for one of the reasons, right? Based on nationality, race, political opinion, religion, or membership of a particular social group. Most people are not trafficked because of their religion, their race, their political opinions, or their nationality. If they were, it's no problem. They're refugees, will fit in, as long as the risk is there. So they won't qualify on that basis. If you look at the patterns of how people are trafficked, it's not normally for those reasons. Which leaves a best membership of a particular social group. What do we mean by a particular social group in this context? We could talk about the Boy Scouts, we could talk about Trades Union, we could talk about all sorts of different groups. But is there a social group of people who are scared of being trafficked? And remember, when we're talking about particular social group and refugee law, there must be something apart from the, the persecution itself which connects them. That The risk or the fear of persecution alone is not enough. Now, in the UK case law that I have seen, if you look back to about the early 2001, 2002 and so on, there are a few decisions of UK immigration tribunals which recognised that certain people who feared being trafficked in the future could be refugees. But they didn't really give any reason. One group was women from northern Albania, which was recognised, but the judge or the, the adjudicator didn't give a reason, as far as I remember, or it wasn't very well explained. 
Another one that served as far as I remember, one from Ukraine. This is going back almost 10 years, but again without any reasoning. And if you look at the reasoning of the UNHCR and its guidelines, what becomes clear, what is interesting is how it, it, it rationalises the notion that somebody who fears being trafficked in the future might be a refugee. They have to show in some way that they're members of a particular social group. So what is a social group? Now, a social group can be based on some innate characteristic, for example, that you're left-handed or red-haired. Or it can be based on a belief that it's so fundamental that you should not be required to change it. How does, we, how does one apply this to people who fear being trafficked? The argument that comes up is that people who fear being trafficked may, if one looks at their past, if they've been trafficked in the past, that is part of their history. Just like if they had broken their leg in the past, that is part of their history. You cannot deny that you broke, well, you can deny it, but it, it will nevertheless remain true that you broke your leg on this day. Similarly, if you have been trafficked, you are trafficked on this occasion. It is part of your personal history. And the argument goes, and this is, and I'm obviously simplifying this a lot through the UNHCR guidelines, the argument goes that people who have been trafficked in the past have this as part of their history. It's not just fact that they've been persecuted. But this is a part of their personal history, that they are people who have been trapped. This is a group of people who are more vulnerable because of that. They are identifiable as a group, people who have been trafficked. And therefore you can have a particular social group, people who have been trafficked in the past, and because of this they face persecution in the future. Now, As part, in fact, at his guidelines in paragraph 39, the UNHCR said it's the past trafficking experience that would constitute one of the elements defining the group. Now, I want to briefly refer to one decision from 2010 of the upper UK Upper Tribunal. It's a case called AZ Traffic in Thailand. And in that case, the, it was recognised that, in fact, you could have a particular social group of people who have been trafficked in the past. I have one or two problems with the decision, and I just, if you'll bear with me in a couple of minutes, I would like to discuss one or two aspects of it. Now, in that case, the tribunal said that, and they were, they were this was not the invention, but they're quoting good, very good authority. Membership, to be a member of a particular social group, you must share some common characteristic or fundamental belief, as I already mentioned, and then they said, and are perceived as a group by society, which is really the definition that you will find in the qualification directive as well, 2004, which I mentioned earlier. Now, that's interesting because in UNHCR guidelines, you don't say that you, to be a member of a particular social group, that you must share a common characteristic and be perceived as a group by society. They say, what? It's a bit different. And this was discussed in the case in 2010. And the tribunal refused to treat these as two alternatives. It said, you must satisfy both. Why? Because it said, well, it might be in country X that people have been trafficked are perceived as a particular social group. But in country Y, the conditions may be so different that they are not perceived as a particular social group, and therefore they are not at risk. And I can see the logic of that if one takes it only that far. I have some sympathy for that argument. There's no reason why a particular social group in country A must be a particular social group in every other country of the world. That I, I have no problem accepting. The problem I have is that it can be, this can be problematic with regard to trafficking in human beings. Why? Because if you think of the people who are at risk, the people who are at risk are victims of trafficking who are to be repatriated to the country from which they have been trafficked. Now, it may be that in that country, let's call it country X, it may be that in that country they are not generally perceived as a particular social group. But I don't think that matters, because it will sure as hell be perceived as a group, as a vulnerable group by the traffickers who want to re-traffic them. That's who they're afraid of normally. Unless we're talking about ostracism by the family, which is a separate matter. The point is, one of their big fears will be possible re-trafficking or some kind of retribution from the traffickers. The traffickers will probably perceive them 
as a particular social group, even if the rest of society doesn't. And it's the traffickers who pose the main risk. So what I'm saying is, well, I appreciate what the tribunal is saying, and I think I'm sympathetic to that. I'm not sure that one can always apply, if one is looking at the protective protection purpose of the Refugees Convention, I'm not sure that one can apply this so easily to the victims of trafficking in that situation. The traffickers are actually the ones who are liable to persecute. So I have a bit of a problem with that. I don't know the answer, but that's the problem. Now, I would like to say that this, in this decision, which clearly approves parts of the refugee, the UNHCR's refugee guidelines from 2006, I would like to say that the guidelines had a big impact. But I'm not so sure that they did. They were referred to. Um, but we find in 2005, a year before the guidelines were published, in the case of Hodger, uh, Baroness Hale in the House of Lords, uh, also already recognised women who have been victims of sexual violence in the past are linked by an immutable characteristic which is at once independent of and the cause of their current ill treatment, and they are certainly capable of constituting a particular social group. So we find this recognition already going back seven, seven eight years in the United Kingdom, right? even preceding the publication of the UNHCR guidelines. So there were some fairly rapid developments. So that in principle, people who fear being trafficked in the future could qualify as refugees, but really it's only going to be in this category, membership of a particular social group, and you're going to have the problems which I've tried to explain to you just now in fitting into that. Otherwise, you will have to go down the subsidiary of a complementary protection. You, I know that people in Geneva don't like to call it subsidiary protection, but I spend more time in Brussels, and they call it subsidiary protection. In other words, the protection you get when you don't qualify as a refugee, but they can't send you home. Why? Because under Article 15b, the risk is one of torture or inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment in your home country. Under Article 6c, the, the potential persecuting actor is a non-state actor, i.e. your trafficker. So I think there's easily scope for that. But I think we can do better than that. I think we can actually go quite a bit further than just talking about subsidiary protection because after all, the rights which are given to people who qualify for subsidiary protection may be rather minimal in some countries. It certainly can be quite a lot less than those provided for under the Refugees Convention. So I will um, come to perhaps the, what I think is an extremely important development. And this was the decision of the European Court of Human Rights in the 7th of January, I think it was, 2010, in the case of Rancia in Cyprus in Russia. And I think this has changed the game in a big way. I think it's a very, very important decision. And let me just briefly explain the facts of the Rancia case. A uh, young Russian woman called Oksana Rancia, um, I think around about 2003, took a flight to Cyprus to work there. She had a so-called artist's visa. This was a visa category which Cyprus had at the time. It was pretty well known that if you were in Cyprus on a so-called artist's visa, that was uh, meant that you were working probably in prostitution. Now, she arrived in Cyprus, and approximately three weeks later, she was found dead on the pavement having fallen about five floors from a flat owned by her ex-employer in Cyprus. How did this happen? Well, how did it get to that stage? It appears that she, when she got to Cyprus, she was told she was expected to work in, some, in the sex trade in some way or another, and she, left, she refused to, and she left her employment. This was important because there was a, her employer was losing money in two ways. One, because she wasn't working for him. Two, because he had a quota of visas, and she was using up one of his quota. And as long as she was there, he couldn't replace her. So, and she disappeared. Now, she was spotted by somebody in a disco or in a bar sometime later, and this was reported to her ex-boss, who called the police, and she was arrested, taken to the police station. Sometime during the night, two associates of her employer turned up, and the police released her into their custody. Now, she was not unlawfully in the country. She had only been in the country about three weeks. If they were releasing her, they should have simply released her to go free, and certainly not into the custody of the associates of the employer. 
A few hours after they released her into the custody of her employer's associates, she was found dead on the street. She had fallen those four or five floors from a balcony, and that was that. How did they? It was never explained why the police did this, but probably they took a bribe. But that was never explained. Now, this case is very, very important because the Ms. Ratzinger's father brought the action under several provisions of the European Convention on Human Rights, but in particular Article 4, the prohibition of slavery, servitude, and forced labour. And he was arguing that both Cyprus and Russia, but I'm focusing here on Cyprus, that Cyprus and Russia had violated Article 4 by failing to take sufficient steps, both in law and in practice, to prevent the San Seba being trafficked. Okay? Now, what's interesting is that, and the courts, in a nutshell, and I'll explain by a moment, in a nutshell, the court found that, in fact, Cyprus had violated Article 4. Now, what's interesting is that Cyprus actually admitted a series of failures in this case, and admitted a series of violations of the European Convention. You find this in paragraph 187 of the decision. And the court could have stopped the case there then, and Cyprus had admitted responsibility. But they said, no, this case is so important, we're going to continue. And they then found a few more violations which Cyprus was responsible for, and Russia. Um, but it's Cyprus which interests us here. And the court said that trafficking violates Article 4, but it did so, and I think on balance this was unfortunate. It did so without specifying whether it's not trafficking amounted to slavery or servitude or forced labour. Now, perhaps it could be all of those, but it said that trafficking clearly violates Article 4 as we understand it in the year 2010. Now, I just think from, the point, from a lawyer's point of view, it might have been nice had the court explained exactly why it thought it was perhaps more slavery or more servitude or more forced labour. But the court uh, avoided that issue. Okay? Now, we get to the stage in uh, about five more minutes, okay? Um, just for those of you who are starting to suffer, give me five more minutes. The, in some ways, when, I'm not saying that refugee law is irrelevant here, but I'm saying that by refugee law I'm referring in particular to the Refugees Convention and the rather restrictive ways in which we can use it. But I think if we combine subsidiary protection and what the RANCF case says about the positive obligations of states towards people at risk of being trafficked, I think we find potentially a lot of protection there, both in the short and medium and longer term. And this is why, uh, this is why identification of people who are at risk of being trafficked is crucial, because unless you identify those people, you will know that you have those obligations towards them. And when I talk about identifying, I'm talking about like some 90-year-old working at this stage. Not just somebody who's very experienced, everybody, every agent of the state who potentially comes into contact with those people, if we take the obligations of the Rancif case seriously, should be trained to be able to spot those people. So what did Rancif say? Rancif established positive obligations to all states, towards those who have been trafficked or are at risk of being trafficked. Remember, this was in the context of Oksana Ranceva, who was released by agents of the separate state, the police officers, into the custody or into the hands of associates of her ex-employer, and she was later found dead, just a few hours later. Same line. Now, in paragraph 284, and it's a long judgment, but you know, if you get the really hot stuff from about 281 to 290, if you, you can forget the rest of the poems. At paragraph 284, the court said, what does Article 4 actually require? What does this prohibition of slavery, servitude, and forced labour require? The court said the state must have a law in force, in effect, criminal law to punish traffickers. It must be effective criminal law. You must have the proper offences of trafficking, and there must be the possibility to mount effective prosecutions and to, and upon conviction, to have appropriate sentences. That's the first part. That's the law enforcement part. It said there must be national legislation adequate to ensure practical and effective, practical and effective protection of victims and potential victims. National legislation, not just policies, law, national law. It said there must be regulation of businesses used as a cover for traffic. So to try to restrict and regulate those who use businesses as a way to promote 
their people trafficking. And there must be immigration rules in place that address concerns with regards to the encouragement or facilitation or tolerance of trafficking. All of that comes out of one little paragraph. These are all legal obligations on states. That is, if that is given effect to a good face, then, in my opinion, you're already doing quite a lot to protect victims of trafficking, both by prevention and, in reality, when somebody comes to your attention, even without using the Refugees Convention. Now, the court then, and this is where I think it's really interesting, because here in paragraph 24, we'll talk about more general measures. In paragraph 26, the court talks about practical measures of protection. In other words, what you must do with regards to the individual who is there, right in front of you, that moment. And the court said the state must be able to take appropriate measures to remove the individual from that situation of risk. So if you take the case of Mr. Anseva, it could mean, for example, finding him there and then, that night, a safe place, some shelter or something, who should be safe in the immediate short term and then till some more medium term option can be found. But the court was very clear. The state's obligation exists immediately the person comes to their attention as a potential victim of trafficking. This is a pretty uh, strong obligation and without the Rancid case we would never have had this. We might imply it, we might suggest it, but the Rancid case makes it crystal clear. Now, then and by the way, I would suggest that this notion under paragraph 26 of taking appropriate measures to remove the individual from a situation of risk would also involve an obligation not to expose them to risk by forced repatriation or by a formal. So I'm suggesting this would include some kind of obligation of non formal as well. The last, the last thing I want to refer you to in this context, moving between refugee law and trafficking law, is something which is so, I wouldn't even call it soft law, it's just so soft you wouldn't believe it. But I, I, I'm, I had a certain role in, in this adoption. This is the, an opinion adopted by the European Commission's Group of Experts on Trafficking in Human Beings. And opinion number 6 of 2010, which was adopted on 22nd of June 2010. Now this is the group that I was involved in, as is somebody else in this room. And our job is to advise the European Commission on development of law and policy with regard to trafficking. But we had a mandate where we could take initiatives of our own as well. And one of one, somebody in our group, it wasn't me, I wish it had been me, but I'm just not that efficient. Somebody found their answer decision. And we were meeting about a week after it. And she said, hey, there's this really hot decision. And we agreed that we should look at it and we should perhaps, maybe we have something to say about it. So a subgroup of us did that. And we only met once every three months or so, but, you know, you might have heard of the thing called email. We, we were able to be in touch in between, of course. And by the 22nd of June, five months later, we had adopted this um, opinion, which is three, is three or four pages long, which sets out our views as to some of the legal aspects of, or legal implications or ramifications of the Ramsey decision as far as states' protection obligations are concerned. And, as I say, this isn't soft law, but it's just something very soft. But it has been used and referred to, I've seen it referred to by quite a few people, so it has some kind of persuasive effect, and perhaps trying to promote a certain way of addressing the, the dilemma of both the state and the person who fears being trafficked. And in that opinion, we said, in paragraph 9, amongst other things, that the state's obligation would include securing the immediate physical safety of the trafficked person or person at risk of being trafficked. I don't think that is, uh, I don't think there's anything soft about that at all. You're stressing what is in the, in, the, in the case, in the decision. It said, and again, I think here we're perhaps explaining what we think it might mean in practice. We have, the state should take measures to include the physical, psychological, and social recovery of uh, people at risk of being trafficked with the immediate provision of information about their rights and options and the language that they can understand. Now, this is to some extent reflected in the EU directive adopted in 2011. And we said that there should be referral to assistance and support with the aim of long-term social inclusion. Now, I don't think one can find evidence in the Rancid decision to say specifically that, but I think one can reasonably infer it from what's in there. So I think that, coming back to Brussels, what I'm having started at Palermo, 
We find here, uh, one moment, we find here the very emphatic uh, statement of the European Court of Human Rights um, that there are certain very, actually quite helpful obligations as far as victims of trafficking are concerned, as far as their protection is concerned, helpful obligations of the state, both in the short term and in the longer term, which ultimately will include an obligation of normal formal, even without the Refugees Convention. I'm not denigrating the Refugees Convention, I think it's a great thing, but I'm saying we could do a lot even without that, and therefore this, this worry, if you like, like the fact that a lot of traffic people will not qualify as refugees, it's perhaps not as great a worry as it would be without subsidiary protection and without the urgency of decision. So in conclusion, I'm saying yes, the Refugees Convention is limited, but we all know that anyway. But there are other options, including subsidiary protection, but I think that the game has really changed a lot, and for the benefit of the protection of victims of trafficking, with the European Court of Human Rights passing its decision in the United States case, as long as states accept to apply their obligations in good faith, which is a big if. So uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I will stop there. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Richard. I think you've raised a, a good number of points there, not only covering a good deal of ground. And as a refugee lawyer, I know that I'm certainly not familiar with most of the trafficking legislation, how that's developed, and especially with the points of contact with refugee law. And it's actually interesting the kinds of circles it seems to go through. Um, I know that we've got a lot of specialists on trafficking in the room, so I'm, I'm very happy to open the floor now. But I wondered if you might just give us a sense of, you've sort of led us up a, up a path so far, and the one which, one which is perhaps quite attractive. Where do you think these, these points of contact are going to go in the future? Do you think that there is any further point of contact, or is it going to be a divorce from now on? Oh, no, I, I don't think it's going to be a divorce, and I, I'm actually very pleased that the quite senior UK judges are willing to accept that the Refugees Convention can apply to people who are at risk of being trafficked, but I don't think one can push that any further than they have so far. I think it's a rather narrow area where one can apply it. And I really think the answer is to go to subsidiary protection or complementary protection. But So I think there, there's almost like two parallel paths perhaps. And I don't see, I don't think one can read anywhere into the Refugees Convention that has been done. But I, I don't think it's such a bad thing. When you were talking, there is one further thing I think we could read in. But rather than going straight to that, I would like to open to the floor. We've got about 15, 20 minutes for questions. If you could just identify yourself Speak relatively clearly so that everybody can hear. And um, it's questions and comments rather than mini lectures. Okay, just a point to be taken into account. Yes, uh, Eric. Richard, I'm Eric Fripp. I'm a barrister and primarily a refugee lawyer. Did we met last week? Yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. um, two things. The first, a quick point. One being whether Rancev, under the trafficking regime, maybe another strand moving towards a, an international administrative law focusing on redress. Uh, the, the comparative that came to mind was the UNCAT committee's general comment number three about the redress provisions, which is trying to, trying to develop uniformity in national provisions. Sorry, but, Eric, could you speak up? I think I'm so that. sorry. But more, direct, more, di more directly, um, I wonder if, in some respect, there, there, there's room for potential concern about getting the regimes, um, seeing the regimes as too closely related. For example, refugee status is something that only lasts as long as you continue to satisfy the Article 182 definition if you're a non-mandate refugee. Being a victim of trafficking, it's, 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 it's an active issue presently when how long you continue to be a victim of trafficking after you're liberated from the immediate custody of the people who are your traffickers or, or the destination for your trafficking. I mean, clearly you stop, clearly you can stop being a victim the moment you're carried out of the house into the police van because you have rights under, under various, various um, conventions after that, in, in particular the Council of Europe Convention. But I do worry about the parallel of the Refugee Convention
being used to argue that status as a victim ceases, you know, if not at the moment when you come out of the flat where you've been engaged in forced labor, sometime soon thereafter, uh, that it, it, it's finite in time. Is that a, a legitimate concern? I, I think it would be a legitimate concern if if the relevant authorities choose to interpret it in that way, I would say that that is incorrect. Because, first of all, I would say that if you don't have a if you don't have a real future fear, then there's no reason why you shouldn't go back to your home country. The fact that you prefer to stay in state A is not the reason why you should stay, right? Um, and I don't think any anybody can make that argument. And in that sense, there's no reason why international protection should cease at some point. But I don't think, if we look at people who have been trafficked, I don't think the moment that you're released or freed or escaped from your traffickers that you cease to be a victim of trafficking. You can go on being a victim for years and years, depending on the kind of physical or psychological trauma that you have suffered. You're no longer in a trafficking situation. But you could be a victim of trafficking for one month, for ten years. Um, And I don't work directly with victims of trafficking, but I've spoken to people who do. Uh, And the some of these things can go on for a very, very long time. So I, 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 w- I would perhaps express it a little bit differently from you, but the, one can remain a victim of trafficking, but I think the real issue is not that in any case. The real issue is, that does the protection subsist? Now, there are two types of protection here. One is the protection from being forcibly returned to your own state. I think if there's no real risk there, then there's no reason why you, you shouldn't go back. But there, there's the risk of re-trafficking or persecution, but there's also the risk of not of somebody being simply returned who is not fit and ready to go back, even if they're not at risk of being re-trafficked, who is not able to integrate. And there's that kind of protection as well. Actually giving the, the, the person who's been trafficked the, the time and the opportunity and the, the support to recover. That's a different type of protection to international protection. Yeah, so you, you, you don't need a well-founded fear to benefit, for example, from Article 14 of, of the Trafficking Convention. No. Okay. Any further comments, questions? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Chloe. I work at EPAT UK, which is a children's charity where I'm issues of child trafficking. Um, I wanted to ask about, with children in mind, um, how much children qualify as a particular social group when it comes to trafficking? Is there any vulnerabilities? Yeah. Um, has that been... I'm, I'm not aware. There might be some other people in the room who are. I'm not aware of any case where children as such have been talked about as a particular social group. But there are, and I'm not trying to avoid your question when I say this, but there are other, once you've got children, anybody under 18, you've got the rights of the child convention, the, the obligation to consider the best interests of the child and so on. So there, there is a wider regime out there which is, is applicable. I, I, I think it is possible that children, I see no reason in principle why children couldn't be a particular social group for some purposes, but I'm just trying quickly to think of a scenario where this might come up. Um, because we know that children are targeted for certain reasons. Um, we also know that women can be a social group for certain purposes. And that women are half the population of the world. But we're not talking about women in the UK, we're talking about women in Pakistan or parts of Pakistan. So I, I can see that um, children might be particularly vulnerable to certain types of forced labour, might be trafficked for that. So I think. I haven't sought it all, all, all the way through, but I, I think in principle it could happen. I'm not aware of any cases right now where it has been argued on the particular MPSG, right? But so you might be aware of something. Yeah. Um, not children. I don't know. Nigerian women. Nigerian women. Nigerian women. Right. Not. Yeah. Can we take two at the time? Uh-huh. Okay. Sorry. Um, Clara Stubank, welcome to Slavery International. Thank you very much, Richard. There's always a very uh, informative and enjoyable lecture. I want to ask a question sort of going back to Ransack and the significance of judgments. And I am with you on the fact that Ransack was a breakthrough judgment and a landmark judgment. But my question is really, sort of stemming from some of the discussions I've been having with the people who are working in this area, it's like, so what what does the judgment actually change? The court reaches the judgment, but how far can the court go in terms of going after 
the government's for failure to actually implement what the judgment has said. So I just thought it might be a useful thing to 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 to, to, uh, to bring up here, and particularly on run sectors, just on the side, it is something that uh, has been argued in courts here already. And there is a judgment against uh, the Metropolitan Police for failure to, to act. But it is something that is not known at all, and, 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 it, and I, I, I agree with you that we, we should publicize a bit more that there is an obligation on the authorities, because the fact that they don't have enough resources might be true, but it still doesn't take away the obligations they have. Uh, coming back to the first part of it, can the court go after states? No. Yeah. It's a short answer. It, it's up to people to to people whose rights are violated to bring actions against the state. One, you can have interstate actions which are extremely rare for, because we imagine the politics of country X bringing an action against country Y. For, it's happened in the past, but it's pretty rare. Huh? So I think that is not a realistic option. Um, so it, it needs... I, I'm, I have no doubts that there are very real obligations arising out of France for all Council of Europe member states. I, and I do think it needs to be more more publicised, that the fact that states are not always aware of it, or, and by states I mean the agents of the state, I mean the police officer on the ground, or the immigration officer, that is not an excuse, it's an explanation. And states do need to do more. The best that the court can do, if you talk about what the court can do, is, is through its own publicity, which is a pretty pathetic thing. It's got a website, yeah, we can publicise this. That is not really very much indeed. I think what one needs it also is the right willpower the part of those in the state who have responsibility to actually promote it. And I've seen this when I've been doing training programs on anti-trafficking, moving just away from that step a little bit, um, in the past, in fact, I think you were maybe even at one of them as well, that you talk to people who are very smart people, they've got degrees in all sorts of subjects, so, you know, we talk about public service, but the trick is not to tell them about the law, that's part of it, but actually it's, it's more to, move, to change their hearts rather than their minds, to persuade them this is something really to go for. Because you can tell anybody, here's right, here's the second you're bound, you're okay. I know I'm bound. So what? Uh, that's the way it works. Yeah. Uh, just to follow up on that, I mean, it's not just the court that can do it, it's the public sector. Because yeah. the public sector is the agency that has to do the training and the training and the training and the training and so I agree with you that there are problems in, in the practical application of it, but I'd rather be in a situation where we have that and we can go and say to say, hey, you must move on this. And it's not just France. We've got the EU directive, we've got the Council of Europe Convention, which is being monitored, and you know, the UK was monitored by Greta but a year ago, and one can clear, clearly there are things which the UK could be doing better, but at least there is a, an external body which has the power to demand cooperation and to investigate things, which has some impact. How much impact, I don't know, because half the people, even, people, even the lot of people who are interested in refugee law, have never had a great. Yeah? I don't know how, how much knowledge goes outside the trafficking world. Okay, thanks. Yes, the second question. Sorry. Hi, my name is Diana Trimenio. I work for the Refugee Law Initiative. Uh -huh. and um, I was just wanting uh, your opinion on, on the maybe the separation between victim protection and refugee protection. Uh, in the past, I worked with UNHCR in, in um, Latin America, trying to actually link the two in state practices. Uh, and working with trafficking victims, sometimes what we found out is that uh, the process of identifying protection needs of trafficking victims with migration officials or police, as you said, um, and talking with the victim. Sometimes the, the trafficking network is so complex that the victim, even after being rescued, hasn't yet identified her, recru her recruiter as part, as part of the network, right? So when you bring the issue of refugee protection and possible persecution when returned, sometimes the link between the two of them actually acts as an awareness-raising process, not only for the officers themselves, but also for the victim. And we have, you know, in Central America, for example, a lot of cases that states publicize as, as good practice in protection of victims being returned and integrated in their society when in, in real life they're, you know, hiding from their recruiters and hiding from their traffickers because there is no possibility of having a, a normal life. There's no effective state protection. So 
I was just wondering, um, you know, how you think that that separation, when you really practice it on the ground, how can it affect, you know, um, that risk of victims and state officers not actually understanding or being aware of the risk of return itself, well, even when the victim wants to return. If people are not aware, then then they, they are, and if they, I would say the victim doesn't have to be aware. It's the, it's the people who are dealing with the victim who need to be aware. Because if, I, if, I'm, the, if I'm the, whatever, the, the police officer, then, uh, of course, if the, victim, if the victim knows and she or he tells me, yeah, I've been trafficked, then I should take action. But uh, your point is that sometimes they don't even, they're not even aware of who's responsible or anything like that. Then it is really up to the state agents to take on that responsibility. The reality may be that it doesn't happen. Then I, I have no answer to that. What we have there, there are quite strong miscarriages of justice, if you like, because people are not getting what they're entitled to and they're probably being exposed to some other risk. But that, that is a... You're, if I understand you correctly, you're asking how would I deal with that. I don't know. I haven't got a clue. Well, yeah. I, no, I was just thinking sometimes bringing in refugee protection uh -huh. within trafficking victim protection creates that awareness, both mm -hmm. in the victim and in the... And, and we've, okay. we've seen it in practice. Right. When we actually, in the interview, for yeah. example, tell the victim, could you face any risk if you go, right. bringing the concept of persecution mm -hmm. in the interview, in dealing with a victim, actually creates that awareness raising process, which in other cases, if you don't well, that's very up, interesting. Yeah, might not actually come yeah. up and then say, well, I just want to go home. Yeah, th th that is very interesting. And that's, that's part of my weakness. I, I haven't been involved directly I haven't trafficked anybody either, by the way. I don't drive a black BMW or anything, but I haven't, I haven't been directly involved. So I, it's very interesting for me to hear that, and I'm a bit at a loss to come back with a constructive response. So, thanks. We've got further comments on that. Yeah. My name is Kirsten. I'm a solicitor. I was just following on from what Jeremy was saying about the lack of awareness. I've had a trafficking victim who had gone through the national referral mechanism, the shelter had taken her to the police who interviewed her, and the police called me up to check because I was dealing with the asylum thing, what she had said. And the comment, the woman did say, this is the first one of these I've dealt with, but her comment was, she came into the UK willingly, and therefore she cannot have been trafficked. She actually came in with what she thought was her boyfriend, but the attitude was, well, she came in willingly chose to come in, therefore she wasn't traveling to interview. But that is completely wrong because we're, I'm assuming that she was ever deceived in some way. Yes, she was. And that clearly comes within the definition of trafficking. Whether it's in the Bible court, whether it's in the Bible court, that it's all a it means they, they, don't under, they don't understand how to apply the law. Yes. But that's totally wrong. Uh, just a question. They don't understand how to apply the law because that's the difficulty really is it sits in the international convention, the irrelevance of the consent, but it's not necessarily in statute. Yeah. And then there is a dissonance because I mean, you know, police often don't even know what the law of the land yeah. is. But I think that's that is an that, that, that is another dimension. Because it's international. Yeah, I, I, and you know, how do how do you apply all international I, law? I then I completely agree and, and I think the UK is a particularly complex case because if you try to find all the UK legislation on trafficking, it's, it's, it's in so many different areas. And just to, even if you just go back in the last five or ten years, it's extremely difficult to find all of it, except for the fact that Greta went and did the report and put it together, which saved a lot of us some time. But so for there is this dissonance and there's a high risk, which might apply to a lot of countries as well. And it might be worse than many other countries. I don't know, because the domestic framework does not satisfactorily reflect what the state's obligations are. And even that would not be the worst thing if in practice it was being implemented in the same thing. Okay. Um, whilst other participants might be going in their thought, I had a, a kind of technical refugee -like question. Uh -huh on all of this issue. I mean, it's sparked by something that you said about the, the Cyprus-Russia judgments about the positive obligations of states to those who have or may be trafficked, encompassing Article 4 and being positive obligations to prevent those sorts of activities. And it reminds me, you know, when I was in practice and we dealt with a number of these cases who came to the Refugee Legal Centre and 
colleagues from the Centre are sitting in probably remember these sorts of cases of trafficked individuals. My recollection is, you know, by and large, these were, these were women, uh, you know, young to middle-aged women. And I wondered, if one's really trying to talk about protecting those refugees, do we even really need to get into the issue of trafficking? Isn't there an analogy with the kind of Shah and Islam situation that, look, in their countries, these, these are women, and there are many aspects of discrimination against women in that particular country. This is one aspect. Their membership is a particular social group of women in that country, and the risk of persecution in that individual case may be may take the form of trafficking as opposed to private violence against which the state also won't protect. Do we even need to go down the trafficking route? Do you think, or can we treat it as a broad as trafficked women as um, one example of a broader problem of discrimination against the parts of society? We don't always need to go down that route, no. But remember, not only women are trafficked. Men are trafficked and children are trafficked, right? But we can, we can look at the issue of gender, uh, gender-related discrimination, gender-related persecution. UNHCR itself published guidelines on that. And the refugee, the trafficking guidelines also refer back to the, the gender-related persecution guidelines. So one could, in some cases, I think, go down that road, but not for all potential victims of trafficking, no? OK. Any final questions before we, we wrap things up? Comments? Oh, yes, two. So one at the back and then one over here. I haven't, we haven't actually met yet. I was just elected from the 1st of January. So the first meeting will be... First, so I, I haven't got too much expertise in how the meetings go. Right. Uh, yes. run, so but the first one will be next month. Right, OK. Yeah. Um, so but I, anyway, I'm but sure that you... Let's have the question anyway. Um, I'll pretend. What, what's your sort of take on the, the extent, the usefulness of monitoring mechanisms? Well... What is usefulness of any other bodies? I, let me talk about the group of experts in Brussels. Who, and the, I do, the experts, it's not my word, that's what they call it, right? It's right, the course. EU's name. I think uh, th there's now the third group, and I was on the second and I'm on the third group, and uh, I think the second group, it wasn't a monitoring body at all, we were there to advise, but we also had this power of initiative, and, and I think we had some, some, some quite good indirect impact. For example, and it comes through even in the, the strategy, the trafficking strategy that was revealed uh, last June and so on. So that group was quite good. In terms of the monitoring coming to, to Greta, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure how much it is publicised outside if you like, the anti-trafficking community. However, if you look at the process, and I'm only going by what I've seen because I've not, I'll be going to Macedonia in May. I'm going to do the Greta bit, the monitoring bit in May in Macedonia. Um, or former Yugoslavian Republic of Macedonia, for those of you from Greece, sorry. Um, the, um, looking at the process, I've looked at, for example, quite carefully at the reports for one or two countries, including the UK and Romania. And it does seem to involve a genuine dialogue between the two. And I think that can be a useful thing. 
even if the words are put very nicely, you can read between the lines sometimes. I've also seen, for example, when the OSCE special representative of anti-trafficking, Maria Grazia Giammarinaro, am I supposed to be standing over here or something? Sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, she visited the UK about a year and a half ago, I think, and she then published a report on, from the OSCE, every organisation in Europe is involved in this. They're all, they've all got their fingers in the pie. And there's this, you can see this exchange of communications between Maria Grazia and the UK authorities. And I would say at some point she almost pulls her punches. She could have been a bit more critical. And I know the way that she works. I know her. So I know how she talks and things. So I could almost see, I think she wouldn't really say that in real life. But she's got to deal with someone. She's got to cooperate. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. So the fact that ever, not everything maybe appears in the report is not, it does not necessarily mean that you're not having a, any impact. Of course, if you completely pull your punches so as not to have any impact at all, then you get to the situation of the Red Cross during World War II, which would refuse to report conditions in the concentration camps because they're scared they won't get back in, which was a complete waste of time. Huh? So I think the monitoring... From what I've seen in principle, because I haven't been actively involved in it, I will be from May, uh, it seems to me to have an impact. And you don't have to persuade the whole world. You need to persuade the people who, are, who have the power and the money to do something about it. Yeah? Okay, well, thank you everybody for your participation, for your comments and questions, and please join me in thanking Richard for his very enjoyable presentation.